Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for coming today. Um, I'm just going to briefly going to introduce myself. I'm Laina Lopez. I'm the program coordinator, senior at the cultural center. For those that don't know me, um, I see so many new faces, so I'm I'm very excited um, to see so many new people coming into the cultural center to our Wednesday luncheon. Um, every Wednesday we have uh, one of this, so feel free to stop by anytime. Wednesdays at noon we have um, free food with uh, some type of discussion, so feel free to come, um, come over and join us for those. Um, quick announcements. Um, on your chairs you will find an evaluation sheet. Um, I would really um, appreciate if you take the time to complete those. I totally understand um, if you have to leave a couple of minutes early because of your class or your work schedule, that is totally fine. Please do it quietly um, to respect um, the person who is presenting. So, um, but then um, turn those in before you leave, okay? Also, if you haven't done that, please sign in. That will help us to keep track on the number of people that comes to these meetings. And um, that would be better for us to, to find money, right? <laughs> to keep having uh, free food at this. So um, with no further ado, um, I'm going to introduce our presenter today is Dr. Mike Prillo. And he works with REACH, but also he's a uh, lecturer from the uh, Political Science Department. And I'm going to let him um, introduce himself and the topic for today. Thank you again. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll, before I start, um, I'll just say if you know if anybody wants to grab like seconds, thirds, fourths, fifths <laughs> through the course of, of the presentation, feel free to. Uh, if you want to uh, you know, hurt my feelings, that I'm offending. I'll be envious of you because like my favorite. So, uh, I am um, a political scientist. Uh, recently um, completed my dissertation. Um, my main area of research and expertise. Um, is ethnic conflict and nationalism. And today I'm going to be presenting uh, some of the research that I've done um, for my dissertation, which I'm <coughs> currently in the process of modifying. And so today we're going to be talking about leadership, nationalism, and discrimination in American politics. <coughs> so we'll begin with the research question. So the research question that I ask is, well, how are ethno-nationalist leaders able to rally, able to rally mass populations uh, against an outgroup. And so if you look at research on ethnic conflict and nationalism, you'll see across the board that the research suggests that political elites are extremely important. They play a pivotal role in the mobilization process that can set the stage for group conflict. And if you look at that research, you'll see it's very clear that nationalist elites in a variety of different settings have been able to persuade followers to engage in a variety of heinous acts ranging from discrimination to, to genocide. Also, what's very interesting is that if you look, yes. Best example, the Nazis in Germany. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, that's probably the best example, yes. Um, also, if you look at this research, what's very interesting is that you'll have various competing theoretical approaches, whether it's rational choice or social constructivist, but at the end of the day, leadership is actually the only area that they all seem to agree on. They will all tell you that political leadership it's essential, it's important. So research on ethnic conflict and nationalism, it generally falls into, very, uh, into two broad categories. Um, the first of these categories are rationalist approaches, and so this will include realism, rational choice theory, um, and other type of hybrid approaches. Um, then there are ideational approaches, and so they'll normally uh, include primordialism, social constructivism, cultural politics, and so forth. And so what you'll find in the research is that research from, from both of these traditions do a very good job of highlighting the strategies that elites use to rouse mass populations against an outgroup or a series of outgroups. But the, the glaring gap in the research is that they haven't really been able to explain why leaders employing such strategies are successful. Right? They don't go to that next level of explanation. 
And so just to kind of briefly cover um, the various approaches and, and what they argue, we'll begin with uh, rationalist approaches. So the rationalist approaches will generally, they tend to place emphasis on the conditions that will set the stage for group conflict. And so more often than not, than not, they'll argue that conflict is basically a function of structural constraints and individual preferences. And they'll argue that ethnic conflict is primarily a result of the pursuit of uh, material goals, um, such as wealth, power, um, security. And so for rationalists then, the main catalysts of, of ethnic war lie in information failures, problems of cred credible commitment, security dilemmas. And so rationalists will argue that these are the factors that foster hostilities between groups. And, and these key factors right here basically allow ethnic extremists to become more prominent in the political arena. Next, we'll move on to the ideational approaches. And so these approaches tend to stress the, the role that elites play in reshaping existing societal understandings of ethnicity or creating new understandings of ethnicity wholesale. And so they tend to focus on the socially constructed character of ethnicity and how elites are able to tap into that, how they're able to manipulate it. These approaches will often emphasize psychosocial uh, factors um, such as status, kinship, group work, group fears, um, and, and so forth. So I argue that, the, that both of these approaches are problematic. The rationalist approaches are problematic because they tend to treat ethnicity as just an instrumental tool that groups can use um, to achieve their goals. But what they fail to do is they fail to account for how identity politics can actually set up the conditions for group conflict. Because if ethnicity is just an instrumental tool and people really don't care about it, then the rationalist explanations fail to explain why people would put collectivist goals above their own personal competing individual interests. In regards to the ideational approaches, the main problem with their arguments is that they just simply lack empirical support. Many of them will often rely on very abstract philosophical social theories and not really provide the sufficient evidence to demonstrate how the various psychosocial mechanisms that they're hypothesizing actually work within real people. So I propose an alternative approach adopt an alternative approach called symbolic politics theory. And so symbolic politics theory ultimately argues that the root causes of aggressive ethnopolitics and violence in turn are hostile myths and symbols that basically justify hatred towards outgroups. And so this approach focuses on group hatreds and the narratives that groups use to perpetuate those hatreds. <coughs> And so symbolic politics argues that the source of these hostile myths and symbols lie in what is called the myth-symbol complex. And so these contain the narratives, um, the stereotypes um, about outgroups. So symbolic politics differs from other ideational approaches in the sense that it doesn't really give elites much power in regards to creating ethnicity or reshaping understandings of ethnic identity, but rather, elites are really bound to the myth-symbol complex of their group. They have to frame their appeals within that, or else they're not going to be successful. And so, under symbolic politics, elites can essentially utilize symbolic appeals to stir up negative emotions and cast an outgroup as an enemy. Furthermore, they can also use these myths and symbols to prey on group fears of, let's say, group extinction, um, to convince the masses to adopt very aggressive policies against an outgroup. So, for example, in the in the conflict um, you know, of Kosovo, you have you know Serbian myths and symbols talking about the epic battle of Kosovo that happened in the 1300s, and and how you know the Kosovo's are, the Kosovars are just you know this this evil group that is just looking to completely wipe them out. And so the general idea here is, is that ordinary people choose emotionally upon uh, of the diff uh, they choose emotionally among the different myths and symbols and respond to the most evocative uh, symbol that's presented to them. 
So I argue that symbolic politics, ultimately, while it is a very powerful explanation, it needs to be expanded a little bit. So you look at research on symbolic politics, and it's clearly demonstrated that successful leaders in ethno-nationalist conflicts, they make quite a few appeals to hostile myths and symbols. Their rhetoric is based entirely on it. However, the approach is less clear as to why myths and symbols matter to group members. Also, the approach as it currently stands doesn't really explain how emotions impact the decision-making process within this whole framework of hostile myths and symbols. Um, also, it doesn't really go um, into too much detail about the psychological processes behind <coughs> leadership and followership. And so I argue that to fill these gaps within symbolic politics, we need to modify it by adding some social psychology to it. And so if you look at psychological research on transformational leadership and inspirational motivation, it suggests that people have basic psychological needs. Um, and these psychological needs um, include positive self-worth, um, a sense of certainty for the future. And if you look into that research, it will suggest and, and I think show very clearly that successful leaders need to motivate and inspire their followers. And so successful leaders need to rouse a sense of pride in their followers. They need to appeal to the group's sense of collective destiny. They need to rouse optimism about the group's future. <coughs> so combining these insights from social psychology with symbolic politics theory, I develop a modified theory. And so Quite simply, I argue that effective leaders appeal to hostile narratives about an outgroup in order to appeal to people's hatreds of that group. But I also argue that leaders also at the same time have to appeal to positive emotions associated with collective pride and optimism for the group's future. Now, we'll stop a second because you're probably thinking, okay, so we're talking about positive emotions and we're talking about negative emotions. Right? That, well, doesn't that seem a bit you know, contradictory? How exactly does that work? And it may seem contradictory at first, but if you look at nationalism and the phenomenon of nationalism, it's very clear that nationalism is comprised of both positive and negative emotions. You'll have positive emotions associated with um, the love of the group, uh, the love of the culture, the nation, and so forth. But you can also have negative emotions associ associated with chauvinism, hatred of the outgroups, um, you know, other types of uh, you know, uh, emotions like contempt, um, and, and so forth. So nationalism being a very complex social phenomenon does have these positive and negative emotional elements. And so it would logically follow then that successful leaders will need to tap into both of those emotions if they want to rally support. And so under this framework, I argue that individuals support nationalist leaders and their chauvinistic policies because it helps to reassert a feeling of collective <coughs> pride and a feeling of optimism for a stable future for the group. So what I propose here is basically a mediational model. And we're going to and we test this statistically. We're going to get into that in a few moments. So basically, we have our independent variable here, which is hostile rhetoric about an outgroup. That leads to the first mediating variable, which is dislike for the outgroup. Also leads to the second mediating variable, which is positive nationalist emotions. And then these mediating variables continue the chain, and they finally lead to support for discrimination. The important thing that you need to uh, just keep in mind about this mediational model is that under this model, the relationship between the dependent variable, sorry, between the independent variable and the dependent variable are reliant, is reliant upon these two mediating variables. <laughs> these variables right here make the relationship between these two possible. So, now we'll talk about the methodology, we'll talk about the fun stuff. So, this model was tested with two experiments. One was conducted here at the University of Louisville, 
had about 122 participants. The other one was conducted at the University of uh, Delaware that had a total of 245 participants. The experiments differed slightly in their design. Um, so uh, I'm going to today talk about the University of Louisville experiment, um, that design and those results. But what I will tell you is that um, the mediational analysis that I propose, um, the data supports it for both experiments. So basically both experiments yielded identical results. And so the experiment focuses on Islamophobia in the United States. And in doing my research for this project, I found that Islamophobia, I think contrary to what many believe, is not something that's just a product of um, you know, our um, interactions with the, with the Muslim world, let's say, since the 1970s. But rather, Islamophobia is actually a very long-standing fixture of American politics. It actually dates back to the colonial era. I mean, you go back to the colonial era, um, you know, the settlers, um, and then the founding fathers, and you will find lots of works that say very hateful and negative things about Muslims. Muslim uh, um, Islam is, uh, in many of these uh, early colonial works, uh, it's often referred to as one of the two great satanic kingdoms, right? The other being, the other satanic kingdom being the Roman Catholic Church. So, and this Islamophobia that we see, um, that is a, a fixture of American politics, it persists today. And we see it reflected in numerous sources, best-selling books, films, political commentary. You can find this material by just going to your reporters or Barnes and Noble. So if you examine the anti-Muslim rhetoric from the colonial era to present, you find a number of reoccurring motifs. The first is this claim that Islam is just an inherently violent religion. Next, you have this view that Islam is completely antithetical to American values. Next, you have the charge that Islam promotes violence, violence and discrimination against non-believers. You also have the allegation that Muslims seek domination of non-Muslims. And you find that this rhetoric, um, while originating with uh, American Christian, is something today that is used by both Christian and secular critics. It's pretty much used across the board. However, in modern times, American politics is governed by a norm of political correctness. And so appeals can't be too harsh. So I argue that blatant appeals to these particular myths and symbols are not exactly going to work. You need to tone it down a little bit. Um, but nonetheless, uh, you can still be quite effective. So the research design. So the experiment um, basically examined the reaction of participants listening to one of two campaign speeches. And so basically what I did was I set up a fictitious political candidate, although the participants didn't know that he was fictitious. Um, they were made to believe that, that he was real. And so um, I hired someone um, to read uh, a, a series of these political speeches um, that uh, basically blast Muslims. Um, it, they were recorded by a uh, professional uh, sound editor. Ambient noise was added, applause. It was basically made to sound like um, a, a local party campaign event that you would see down in South Florida um, that I have attended numerous times working on campaigns when I, when I was an undergrad. And so the context of the political speech was that this uh, uh, candidate was running for um, Congress in Florida's 8th District. And he was running against an incumbent who was in real life criticized for being weak on suspected Muslim terrorists. Right? So there was this whole actual story um, about uh, this candidate um, not following up on um, uh, a phone call made by one of his constituents about uh, a concern that her husband was a Muslim terrorist that married her um, to simply you know, gain a green card. Um, and it ends up that the person actually was uh, a terrorist. And, and there was a big controversy um, about this. And the content of the speeches are basically taken from mainstream popular works on Islam. So it's like I'm not making up the speeches here. Um, I'm actually using um, you know, real rhetoric and basically just pulling it from different sources, kind of putting it together um, into one particular, uh, into one single person. 
And so participants of, uh, in the experiment were randomly assigned to one of three groups. And so the first group, they heard no speech at all. That was your control group. Next, there was the second group, and their speech framed the argument in terms of a security threat. So the argument in that speech was, well, we know that not all Muslims are bad, but they pretty much operate in secrecy, the bad ones, and so we just need to discriminate all of them for the purposes of our security. And then the third speech frames it as an existential threat, where Muslims are basically, you know, the spawn of Satan, um, it's this evil religion that's looking to destroy us, playing on all of the exaggerated fears of extinction. Because of the norm of political correctness that we have in our country, I argue that the second speech that frames it as a security threat is the one that is going to be effective in terms of rousing the mediational process uh, that, uh, that I hypothesized. So all of the speeches essentially propose the same policies. And these policies include having religious affiliation listed on government IDs, exiling um, Muslim citizens um, suspected of terrorist activity, deporting non-Muslim citizens suspected of, in any way of terrorist activity, denying entry visas to Muslims expressing anti-American sentiments abroad, revoking the citizenship of any Muslim citizen suspected of terrorist activities, and closely monitoring uh, Muslim citizens in the district. It's a pretty harsh agenda. <coughs> the only difference in the speech, again, was the rationale for why these policies need to be implemented. And so again, we have the security threat versus the existential threat. So after students are assigned uh, to their groups, they first uh, completed a pretest survey, and this survey elicited um, demographic information, um, information <coughs> about their race, their political views, um, their attitudes about Muslims, as well as other uh, um, immigrant groups, um, Pakistanis, Indians, Hispanics. Next, they completed a word association exercise that had absolutely nothing to do with the rest of the experiment. It was merely meant as a distraction measure. Um, and it was actually very interesting because students really, uh, uh, the participants, really were focusing on that word association <laughs> um, exercise and, and were taking far more time on it than I, I had anticipated. <laughs> so I suppose it did work as a distraction. Next, they read a biographical sketch of the candidate um, from the Orlando Sentinel. And so this was basically talking about his campaign, um, his, uh, his background, um, his position um, on the issues. Um, and it was also, um, I had it uh, examined by many um, journalists to make sure that it looked real, that it looked authentic. Then participants listened to one of the speeches. If you were in that control group that heard no speech, they simply moved on to the post-test survey. And so the post-test survey basically um, assessed people's reactions to the speeches. Um, it asked them um, if the speeches elicited a variety of emotions um, and ask people the degree to which they support the individual policies, um, the degree to which they support um, the platform as a whole, um, ask them questions about whether they would vote for the candidate, um, had he been um, running in their electoral district, and, uh, and so forth. Yes? Um, with the people who didn't hear any of the speeches, did they have a post-test survey? Yes, they had a post-test survey um, as well. And I'm, I'm glad that you asked that. Um, perhaps I, I wasn't clear enough. So the biographical sketch of the candidate, at the end of it, it says, if elected to office, he wants to handle uh, you know, the issue of, uh, of uh, Islamic terrorism. And so um, if he's elected, he's committed to passing these policies. But it doesn't go any further. It doesn't give any reasons why. It doesn't go into any explanation. It just basically says, and if he gets elected, he wants to pass these policies. And, and that's it. And so then um, the people that are in the control group, they still answer the same questions um, about the policies and how the candidate made them feel um, and, and so forth. And then finally, when the experiment was over, they were debriefed. They were told that the candidate was fictitious, it wasn't real. And, uh, 
no one was under any emotional distress <laughs> as a result of that, in fact. So that's a good thing. So the variables. So we have dislike of Muslims, and dislike of Muslims was measured on a one to nine scale, um, ranging from like to extreme dislike. Next, we have national pride and optimism for America's future. These were both measured on a one to six scale, ranging from strongly disagree to strongly agree. And these two variables were combined to create a, posit a composite measure um, called nationalist emotions. And next, we have support for policies. This is the variable asking about the overall support for the candidate's policies. <coughs> And this was measured on a one to six scale, don't support at all to fully support. And then um, for the treatment for the test group variable, I merely dummy coded that um, so that um, one equaled uh, um, speech two um, and the other uh, two, um, the, the, uh, sorry, one equaled um, speech two and then zero equaled the other two speeches. So now we'll first. I'm um, talk about the, uh, the averages, the, the descriptive statistics, the analysis of variance. And so the average level of support for the candidate's policy platform did differ across the three conditions. So for group one that heard no speech, on average, don't support at all. For group two that heard the security threat speech, the average was somewhat support. And for group three that heard the existential threat speech, don't support very much. So we do see the highest rate of support among this, uh, with this security threat speech. And an important thing to note is, is that um, between the two experiments, 37 to 40% of all participants fell within the somewhat to fully support range. Right? So that's a considerable number of people. That's currently better than our president's approval ratings at, at the moment. That gives you an indication. And this was meant to be an extremist agenda. So the analysis of variance revealed a statistical difference between the groups. And so we see that with the F test and the P value, it's below 0.05. Um, we also um, have various post hoc tests that I won't go too much into, but they basically affirm that group two was statistically significant. It was statistically different than the rest. So now we'll go to the mediational analysis. And so I won't go into too much detail about uh, all of uh, these statistics. I can see the glazed looks um, on people's <laughs> eyes uh, already. Uh, but what I basically, uh, what I will tell you some things to note is that first of all, all of the paths in the mediational um, causal chain um, were confirmed. Um, they were statistically significant, um, and they exhibited a positive relationship. So being uh, um, hearing the second speech um, led to an increase um, in uh, dislike for Muslims, which led to a support for the policies. Likewise, hearing the, the second speech led to an increase in the feelings of nationalist emotions, which led to an increase in support for the policies. And we can see that all of the p-values are well below um, 0.05, which means that it is statistically significant. Now, furthermore, well, if you look here at the bottom, you'll see the total effect of the independent variable on the dependent variable. And we see that that is statistically significant. Then we have what down here, the direct effect of the independent variable on the dependent variable. And we see that that is not statistically significant. In mediational analysis, you want to see this. Because what this basically shows you right here is that when we add those mediating variables um, into the equation, the effect of the independent variable on the dependent variable basically diminishes. It goes down to nothing. And that's what you want to see because that actually demonstrates that the mediating variables are doing what they're supposed to be doing. We also have um, some more um, statistics. Um, we have the Sobel test, and the Sobel test um, basically um, confirms um, that, uh, that the mediators um, did indeed um, facilitate the relationship between the independent um, and the dependent variable. And then we also have um, some confidence intervals 
that basically affirm that as well. So, the mediational analysis suggested that hearing a speech about the threat posed by Muslims prompted both positive and negative emotions that led to support for discrimination. And this is very much a challenge to conventional approaches on ethnic conflict, uh, nationalism, and racism because these literatures primarily focus on negative emotions. They focus on negative emotions as the factor that prompts racist behavior, and they also cite negative emotions as being um, a consequence of being on the receiving end of, of racism and discrimination. Right? So my findings suggest that positive emotions also play a role. It's very important to note that national pride, right? Pride and optimism, according to psychologists, are secondary emotions of joy. Right? So these are positive emotions. Right? People are feeling good about the prospect of discriminating Muslims. Additionally, I had run another model where I had factored in political ideology, religiosity, and as well as threat perception of Muslims. I had a question in there um, asking, well, you know, did the candidates, uh, you know, comments, uh, you know, make you feel like, you know, that Muslims were a threat? All of these variables were tested and none of them had an impact on support for the policy. Uh, they were not related to any, they were not correlated with any of the variables placed in, in this analysis, which further suggests that people didn't support these policies because you know, they heard this speech and they thought that Muslims were a threat. You know, that, that wasn't it. You know, they supported these policies because they didn't like Muslims, and the idea of discriminating them basically made them feel good. So again, the findings suggest that rousing positive emotions associated with pride and optimism are merely another means by which um, nationalist leaders can, can obtain support. And if you think about it, this is far more unsettling than um, getting people to support these policies by manipulating anger, fear, or rage. And so the next uh, step that I would like to take with this research is to um, investigate if the mechanisms that I've identified apply to other groups. I have a feeling, I suspect that it actually would apply um, to Hispanic immigrants because Hispanic immigrants um, can definitely be considered more of a demographic threat. Their numbers in this country are far worse, uh, sorry, are far higher than, um, than that of Muslims. Um, also, in many ways, they are a, they compose an economic threat um, in terms of uh, you know the fact that people claim that they take away jobs, they hurt our economy, um, and also um, many argue that there are a cultural threat as well, um, and this is uh, evidenced by uh, uh, some Tea Partiers that were running uh, in Tennessee, um, you know that basically said that uh, um, basically cited this you know massive uh, Catholic conspiracy the parts of the Hispanics um, to uh, basically you know, dominate America uh, with, uh, with that religion. Um, also, um, I would be interested in investigating um, if whether this applies to, let's say, homosexuals. Now, obviously, homosexuals are not a racial or an ethnic group, um, but it would be interesting to see if, if some of those same, uh, the same mechanisms you know, do, uh, do apply there. So uh, do you have uh, any questions or, or any thoughts? <coughs> okay. Yes. Um, could you kind of more clearly define what you mean by outgroup? Like, is that a minority, or like, what exactly does does that mean? Um, I would classify um, an outgroup um, as as basically um, you know any group uh, that is kind of outside <coughs> of uh, you know the mainstream. So, for example, um, I don't like to use uh, majority and minority because you know, for example. Um, if you're a part of a minority group, well, you know that's that group is your is that's the in group, and the majority group would be an out group. Uh, so, kind of just taking it in terms of group dynamics. So it's not helps. necessarily related to who has power and who doesn't. It's no. just, I'm in a group, so the other is the out group. Exactly. It works in the other direction. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. 
did you consider the concept of a scapegoat that uh, some political leaders uh, use um, events that happen to blame, uh, uh, put blame on an outgroup, like blaming uh, the Muslims for 9-11 just because a few individuals who were Muslims com uh, committed that? Mm -hmm. um, scapegoating is something that um, um, I, I definitely agree that you know, that could play a role in terms of the hostile rhetoric. I um, mean, if you look at some of the other symbolic politics research, which is qualitative, I mean, you know, you'll see that a lot of the rhetoric is, is based on you know, scapegoating. Um, in regards to my experiment, it's not something that I tapped into, um, just because I found that to be something difficult to kind of measure within an experimental setting. Uh, yes. Uh, you you mentioned earlier on about like the I guess like the interaction between the uh, I think you were saying that the community support for some sort of, for, uh, for I guess, demonizing an outgroup, mm -hmm. and then their leaders who then would channel that, I mm -hmm. guess. And so I was wondering, I thought that was kind of an interesting concept of that, like, that there's like a, that it's a two-way street between the constituents and the political leaders. I was wondering if you're planning on delving into that, and, like, any further in the future, or? Um, yes, I, I do. Um, I am interested in kind of further refining this whole kind of leader follower process um, and, and really exploring, um, you know, how far a political leader can push it uh, in terms of the rhetoric that, that he appeals to. One of the other findings uh, of my dissertation, which I didn't discuss here for the sake of time, was that um, I found that. Um, for people that had a positive feeling, uh, a, a positive attitude towards Muslims, they, they didn't exhibit any dislike of them. For those people that heard um, the existential threat speech, it basically turned them against the campaign. Um, and they didn't support any of his policies. They didn't support um, him as a political candidate. Um, it basically prompted you know, opposition. Um, and, and that's very interesting because it does show the limitations of, of leadership. You know, this, this whole idea that, you know, leaders kind of have this freedom to just completely redefine, um, you know, social identity um, is, is probably not the case. So, any other questions? Yeah. Well, just a comment. <coughs> uh, since ad agencies have known for close to a century that people, uh, most people rather, make decisions based on, you know, their right lobe, their irrational or emotional uh, side, uh, Every politician, even one not uh, campaigning, uh, you know, on a bigoted platform or a chauvinist platform, manipulates symbols. I mean, that, that's that. Uh, the Liberal Democratic Party in Britain tried. Uh, I mean, the surveys show that people support most of uh, their policies, but they don't have any sizzle with the state. I mean, the, the joke was uh, the Liberal Democrats cheer was what we want moderate reform, when do we want it, in due course. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, it, it didn't get any fires lit under anybody. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, and I, and, I, and, I do, and I do agree. Um, the, the interesting thing, though, is that if, if you look um, to political science, international relations, comparative politics uh, literature, the, the dominant theoretical model is the rational choice model, which basically argues that people are rational decision makers. Um, and that they do not, um, you know, make decisions based in this in this emotion. Yeah, excuse me, I ask you a question because that I thought that phrase originated with the economist James Buchanan about a quarter of a century ago, but it's now a political science concept, rational choice. Oh yes, well, I mean, it's it's something that you see in economics, and okay. I mean, political science is known for just kind of pillaging from you know every ah, other okay. you know, social science field that's out there. Not so. like the English language. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yes. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah. people who, you know, I don't know, like grab their wallets if they see a Muslim person. 
you know, you know, okay. System. Well, all of the all of the sources um, that I looked at, I looked at quite a few of, of the primary sources. Um, many of them, um, and so in the early period, you have a lot of uh, the rhetoric kind of focusing on Islam as a religion um, and kind of the theological differences uh, between Islam and kind of the Protestantism um, of the United States. Um, you see in the 20th century that starts to change a bit. There's more of, of the rhetoric on um, Islam, uh, on Muslims uh, throughout the world based on the various interactions that we've had um, with them. But I would say in the last 10 years or so, particularly since 9-11, um, all of those sources that I looked at, um, many of them do propose these discriminatory, these discriminatory measures that I mentioned, uh, that I used in the speeches. Um, as a matter of fact, that's where I got uh, you know, those, those measures from. And I didn't make up those policies. Those are things that actual political commentators um, you know, have proposed. Um, and so in that sense, um, I mean, I would say in the more recent work, um, that I, I can say with uh, confidence that you know, they wanted to discriminate. But in terms of the previous um, uh, you know, the, the historical documents, um, you know, all I can really say is, is that there was expression of antipathy uh, towards Muslims. Okay. Yes. Um, in the case of people who um, were actually in support of policies, uh, especially the ones who heard speech too, to what extent do you think that was garnered from framing it in a you know, like security threat paradigm, as oh. opposed to just like you know imbuing it with this nationalistic fervor that kind of buoyed those those feelings of hate, or at least kind of veiled them? Oh, one of the things that that I that I argue um, in in the uh, the dissertation is that you know one of the reasons why that speech was more effective is because it provided a rationalization. You know, it's, it, it provided this this argument where it's like, okay, well, yeah, you know, we're we're not we're not saying that all Muslims are bad, and uh, you know, and it kind of provides this, you know, this, this almost this rationale of like, well, you know what, if if you're not engaged in any terrorist activities, well, you know, you have nothing to worry about. You know, you're gonna you're gonna be fine. And that's, and I think that that is the type of thinking that uh, that was probably going on, um, you know, with that. But but no, I I, I definitely agree that um, you know, that was definitely going on. Yes. Um, um, I was wondering, because um, you mentioned that your experiments were done in Kentucky and Denver. Uh, Delaware. Delaware. Yeah. Okay. And I was just curious to see if you were thinking of doing more research. Uh, elsewhere, like in the West or the South? A long term project uh, that I would like to do is to actually compare Islamophobia in the United States, Britain, and France, and, and see if, if there's any differences uh, in terms of these mechanisms across these different countries. Uh, so that's something that I definitely like to do. Because I, mean, I had like, a similar thought. So like, I was just sort of curious like, did you find that? Like the Delaware group in the rule in general was like they're the same division of like conservatives and liberals, um, you know, let's say Christians, non you know, like kind of like religious factors. Like, did you find, because I know you said that those didn't have any bearing, like a Democrat or mm -hmm. Republican equally or, you know, well, or other. what I did find in terms of the demographics, um, both, uh, both groups um, professed that um, religious beliefs guide them. Um, the University of Delaware uh, sample was uh, predominantly Catholic, while the U of L sample was predominantly Protestant. Um, interestingly, the U of L sample um, was slightly uh, more conservative than the um, Delaware sample, but for the most part, um, there were not a lot of conservatives in, in the sample. It was primarily, you know, left left of center uh, college students. Uh, that basically uh, you know, supported these policies, and that's why I was, you know, fascinated by the the level of support because I had figured that, you know, okay, well, I have these predominantly liberal samples. I figure, okay, this is going to make it more difficult for me to find it because the liberals aren't going to go through this, but many of them, many of them did. But if you think about it, you can see why a liberal might not like Islam, right? You have these charges of the fact that it doesn't treat women very well, doesn't treat minorities very well. You can see that um, being um, you know, in conflict with, with traditional liberal values. Yes? Do you think that 
Do you think that they might have had a different opinion after thinking about it for a little while, like a day or a month later, like that the fervor, like the emotional appeal might have been lessened after some time thinking about it? Buyer's remorse. Yes, that that may that may have been that may have been the case. Um, the reason why I did not uh, opt to do repeated measures um, or to do um, you know something like that where there's you know uh, more of a time lag um, is just because of the fact that there was deception involved. Uh, there's only there's only a, you know so long you go before you know. Uh, the whole the jigs up basically, and everybody knows that it's just for one use. So uh, that's why, like for both experiments, uh, I mean, we, you know, at Delaware, 240 people, the experiment was run in one shot in these large classrooms um, in one evening, um, and then the same thing here at, at U of L. So that people don't have the time to look up that candidate on the internet. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. I came late, so maybe I missed it. So, um, in those groups, um, did you look into the, um, the role of ignorance, about Islam? Uh, do, um, they, do they know much about Islam or just what the media is, is, is showing them? No, actually, I did have questions in there, um, you know, asking people, um, you know, their knowledge of Islam. You know, do you know, um, you know, who the prophet of, of Islam is? Um, you know, have you, uh, you know, are you familiar with the five pillars? Of, of Islam, and, and they had you know these these questions. Um, I had a series of questions, um, gauging people's knowledge um, about Islam, and that variable also was not statistically significant, because when you kind of really you know broke it down, um, you saw people supporting these policies that knew absolutely nothing about Islam. You know, they never heard of the Quran, um, but then you had others that you know that knew quite a bit about Islam. And, and had support. So I'm uh, kind of have to decide. Any other questions? I guess. Uh, is there anything else you want to say, or are we good? Okay. Did, all right. I guess we're good. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I just want to thank you, Dr. Grillo, for your presentation, and thank you guys for um, coming in today um, and be with us um, for an hour. Um, please don't forget to fill out your evaluations. Uh, we'll really appreciate it, and if you haven't signed in, please do so. That will help us to keep track on the number of people that comes to this event. Thank you, and have a great afternoon. Your best friend a long time. Yeah, wow. That's right. <laughs> I shouldn't have.